How much time we got? Now. Ready? Yep. One minute, two minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, from Haverford College, Home Box Office would like you to meet Robert Klein. Thank you very much. Thank you. And welcome, welcome uh, all of you who, is the sound on? Wel welcome all of you who is waiting out in the, I, is the sound, yes it is, here it is. Uh, waiting out in the cold and all that, it's a pleasure to see you, it's such a cute place. <laughs> nice trees, stony buildings, lovely, cute, easy pace, I like it. Yeah. <laughs> nice, quiet, nice, you can learn this way. Um, came down on the New Jersey Turnpike and such a contrast. And you know that section around between Newark and Elizabeth? You get a nice... <laughs> the oil refineries there. You get a nice smell of universal fart for about 20 minutes. <laughs> totally toxic air. Notice there are very few houses in that area. Uh, great to be here. Uh, it's a cozy little place, nice old tradition, pictures of old geezers on the wall. <laughs> 1822 to 1904, you know. I can hear some of the graduates singing. It's an old and venerable place. Um, we hear there are others watching us too now, but it's subscription. These folks pay. This is not regular television. You can say, this is mature, we've grown up. You can say any, shit! <laughs> How do you like that? Shit! Oh. What a catharsis. Anyway, I don't think I use pornography gratuitously, but on television, you can't say anything. It's nice to be here in person, and you have a little time. We're gonna have a little time together, even the folks at home. Uh, the talk shows are okay, you know, but I, I do the Tonight Show, I sit, come in, I have to be funny in a hurry. It gets a little time. Six minutes and boom, 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 boom. Got to be funny in a hurry. Then I sit down on the panel. Well, Johnny, we went back to LA, then we came home to New York, and boom, move over one chair. <laughs> <laughs> wave my way through Tony Randall. And I kiss people I never met. Hi. <laughs> move over one. I feel sorry for the intellectuals, the authors that come on. They have two minutes left at the end for them. I feel so just enough time, two minutes, for Henrik Van Loon to discuss his new book, The History of Mankind. <laughs> Dr. Van Loon, can you uh, briefly tell us... Uh, briefly, I kill you! <laughs> Son of a bitch, I come from Copenhagen! <laughs> they get so cranky because... Uh, well, I talk about... People ask me about the various television personalities. What do they like? Merv Griffin. I, I don't do his show too much. He's a lovely guy. Show is a little decadent, but I mean, he asks me. He's a lovely guy personally, but he asks such personal questions. You know, I'm standing there in front of uh, seven million people. He said, I understand you had two orgasms yesterday. Right? Uh, can you tell us about them? Their intensity, their length, you know. I'll be doing that from time to time. I call that, I call those scaries. It's sort of my italics. <laughs> uh, uh, 
to accentuate, when nothing, simply nothing else will do to explain something. Like, <laughs> you ever get one of those surreal moments in your life when you go, what is this? Where's reality? <laughs> but panic. This might be the science fiction film, an excellent one. What's the one with James Whitmore about the giant ants? Them. Very standard things in those things. Usually there's a, an old scientist like Edmund Gwen, and he's calm about it. He usually has a very attractive daughter that everyone wants to. <laughs> she never gets anything. Do, do women get short shrift in, in horror movies among other things? I, I guess you haven't. I guess you haven't thought of it in these terms, you know, but. It, the insect could be breaking down the door and they, they, they find time for a little nookie. I love you, Dolores. <laughs> stay here, darling. You know, she I want to come with you. No, stay here. We'll need some cocoa. You know. <laughs> I play a lot of colleges, play all kinds. And I never know where I'm going to play. Like, this is a kinky little venerable old theater. I play gyms, a lot of gymnasiums. Uh, with very unshow business like things on the mirror in the dressing room there like that. Do not dribble excessively. Desire is half the game. Pass the ball, you know. I play, uh, I play chapels. I played two chapels just a few weeks ago at Emory University. I played one at uh, Wake Forest. And I played one at Georgetown last year in Washington. This beautiful old chapel with frescoes and all kinds of murals beautifully painted a hundred years ago or so, depicting every diocese in the world. And all during my bits, I can hear, what is that thing? Have you seen this? Looks like he's taking the oath for the Supreme Court. This I promise I'll do anything. Everywhere I go to colleges, people always have a college rationale. That's a story that someone tells all their friends hundreds of times about why they went to this school. And it's boring to everyone but them. <laughs> Luckily, only they have to listen to it hundreds of times. You know, it's usually, well, the library is, of course, uh, one of the best. <laughs> well, it's a small school, of course, and I'm... <laughs> Well, of course, uh, Northwestern was considered the best for <laughs> the Air Force Academy kids. Said, well, Mr. Klein, you know, you get a good engineering degree for nothing. You only have to be in the Air Force 16 years. <laughs> You're way ahead, you know. <laughs> they were nice kids, you know. Like, there was one touching thing there with one of the kids, the Air Force, or two of them, I was having a conversation with them. They wear the same thing, see, which is a kind of, it eliminates one decision-making process. And, <laughs> In the morning, when you're going to go, should I wear my blue polo? Or, you know, that choice you make every day. Should I wear my blue shirt or my green? You know, they go, gray, that's it, goodbye. <laughs> and it saves them a few minutes of sleep. You know, they get to class sooner. But <laughs> from the stage, it's a mind blower. 3,500 of them out there, a three-tiered theater, looked like a moving Brillo pad. <laughs> easy to time the show. They do everything together. Prepare to laugh. Whoop! <laughs> Ready to laugh. Ho, ho! <laughs> yeah, for the next two. Sit up, punchline, laugh. Small chuckle. Ah. Oh. <laughs> very kind. After the show, that Mr. Klein, we think you're fine. Mr. Klein, we think you're fine. <laughs> I did see this hazing there, which is... They grabbed this freshman, and his only crime was he was there at the time. You know, What's your name, idiot? I'm fourth classman Jay Gerard, sir, 462. I can't hear you, moron. Where'd you get those pimples? I don't know where I got the pimples, sir. <laughs> I have to look at this, and it's not going to make him a better officer, is it? 15 years from now, he's not going to thank him. I'm glad they made an asshole out of me back in the <laughs> That's one of the finest things I've ever done, you know. Everybody has it. I went to Alfred University in New York State. It's always, thank you, you don't have to be polite. It's always good for three claps in Bryn Mawr and <laughs> Haverford, Pennsylvania. Listen, if I say Bryn Mawr, Haverford, you know, I know it's like St. Paul and Minneapolis. <laughs> it's like St. Paul and Minneapolis. 
God, they're gonna send back the nine bucks for the subscription for this television when they see it. This show is absolutely live here now. I certainly hope Mayor Lindsay makes it for another term. I hope the Phillies... No, I mean, what mistakes we're leaving in, Jim. This is all natural. This is real. This is, you know. Yeah, it's a stream. I don't know what he said, but whatever it is. We don't know. It's a couple of people lateral. There's a John Wilkes Booth position up there. <laughs> I'm crazy! You know, it's, it's, I have these dreams once in a while. Uh, they have these. Alfred University. Why did I go there? Not because of, well, one good reason. <laughs> Lovejoy's college guide said at the time that Alfred would accept you if you were in the top 82% of your class. <laughs> but I went there for the kinkiest of all reasons, the brochure. It was a beautiful brochure with healthy looking people walking on the campus with books. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, an act of life is, you know, always like that. They're always looking to the future and forward in, in brochures. Students are always, you know, throwing snowballs in front of the fraternity house, you know, studying, <laughs> tests. It's always, you know, they never show other pictures a little more uh, down to earth than a brochure. You'll never see, for example, I'm gonna flunk out of this goddamn place. <laughs> Lost $200 in a card game. <laughs> I'm pregnant. Yeah. I'll show a lot of this. <clears throat> I wanted to be a doctor. Uh, a few things. Everyone I went to school, what are you applauding for doctors? <laughs> Everyone I went to school, I graduated in 62. Everybody I went to school with is a doctor now. Every place I play, you know, I get this business card thrust in front of my nose. Or, Dr. William Zachary, surgeon. I go, hey, Bozo, how are you? <laughs> well, I'm a surgeon now. Come on in, Bozo, you still throw up a lot? <laughs> Bring him right down to earth. <laughs> William Zachary. You know, they're probably great doctors, but I wouldn't go to any of them on a bet. Because I don't care what's gone down in 13 years, I remember them as I always will. Like, Come on, let's get late again. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna throw up again. You know, it's really... Care what they are now, you know. I never learned to handle this mic cable. I wish I was like those singers, you know, they always know how to do it in the same. I never went to that uh, singer's mic school, you know. I hear music when I look at you. Yeah. <laughs> you know what they say? Hey, hey, Philadelphia. I love you, baby. Yeah. They use the wire. Button up your overdrive. <laughs> By you. <laughs> to that school. When I was working out at the improvisation in New York, learning my craft, I used to see those singers, and many of them had no mic technique. And, uh, you know, they, they, it was sort of an odd thing to them. And when you hit a very loud note, you automatically, if you watch Sarah Vaughan, you go, ah, when this intimate, it comes back, you know. And they would get it mixed up, you know, ah! <laughs> You, you. Or a lot of them have a lot of false vibrato. They shake their voice because they got bad habits from some singer they emulate. You know, like, I love you. And the audience starts to vibrate sympathetically until they reach a common frequency and it sounds straight to them relatively. I like singers with bad diction, except when they sing. I like to do a song for us now from the Broadway musical Carousel. Maestro. When you're alone, <laughs> and the melody sings to you, hand up. That's a gesture they often use. And you know that it sings to you, hand out. <laughs> look to the sky, they look down. You can often tell when a novice singer is bombing when they ask you to clap along. But it's kind of a defensive thing, like, hey, I'm bombing! Bomb with me, everybody! 
it's more out of that spirit than that you absolutely have to get right into it. Like, uh, for example, <laughs> he started to clap. Now we're going to hear this all the time. Everyone, we won't know if a clap is a real one or it's like. <laughs> Sorry, I realized I'd lost control of the show. Oh, God of humor! I feel the dance. Those are dancers always look like someone's holding them back at the shoulders. Space, I want to eat you. <laughs> Dancers love space, ask her. I had to take dance at the Yale Drama School. Pearl Lang was my teacher, Martha Graham technique. I was like immature, I felt embarrassed wearing leotards. I used to hang around like macho stances. <laughs> What's the score of the Mets game? <laughs> I was a history political science major and I, I, I had to read, we heard one applause for the <laughs> I don't want to have to go through the whole thing. All right, so shh. <laughs> Psychology, you know. I had to read Henry Kissinger in 1958, Necessity for Choice. No, no, the book was 58. I graduated in 64. The only book ever written with an accent, incidentally. No, no the problem is, it was written exactly like that. Literal one. It was a very interesting philosophy. He said, we should arm to the teeth and the Soviets should arm to the teeth so it'll be, we'll have so many arms that we wouldn't dare have a war. <laughs> the best course I ever took was abnormal psychology. <laughs> I love that course. No more theoretical bullshit. There they are in front of you, sick people. <laughs> Five hundred page textbook, six hundred pictures, all beauties. <laughs> I read it the first night. We spent hours and we, we got off on it, but we, we learned too. Look at the freak on page 238. <laughs> <laughs> the Zambuli brothers of Austria, born, joined at the fingertips and toe tips. Sometimes called the gingerbread brothers, but... Uh, <laughs> Alfred, when I first went in, they made fun of the way I spoke. <laughs> you know, you think I talk funny? <laughs> One thing about me, I have self-confidence. <laughs> That's my fantasy of how I feel on the inside. I went there when I was 16, and it's way 400 miles from New York City. I was an urban kid, and I can tell you the truth. Don't applaud for it. Don't applaud for everything. <laughs> Save it for something. <laughs> It's frostbite. It's a chilly night tonight. Nice night. I went away to a very rural place. And uh, I must say in, uh, now, with perspective, being 33 years old, I can say it was really quite valuable because to live four years of your life in a place totally unlike where you usually live, of course, it was a bit of a shock getting off the train. And, ah, ah, ah. Are these the dormitories? <laughs> the first thing I did was make fun of New York talk, you know. <laughs> but there were regionalisms everywhere. They spoke funny to me, but I knew, hey, Bab. They were from near Buffalo. Hey, Bab, my father gave me a dollar to get married. <laughs> we're getting married next week. Then we're going to Buffalo. We're going to Niagara Falls. We're coming back. <laughs> we're coming back. And there's always a kid that came up to me, hey, Bab, you from New York? I go, yeah. He said, do you know a guy named Tony Jones? <laughs> 14 trillion. Now, I usually knew the guy, but there's no excuse for an asshole question like that. <laughs> there was something that was quite, <clears throat> uh, kind of put me off a little in my first, uh, you know, time there and uh, for a while thereafter. I'd never really faced blatant anti-Semitism before. It was really quite something. And um, my first day there's something sort of spoken from a fraternity house porch to me. Uh, subtle, 
Subtle to be sure, you know. Like, Jubai! <laughs> Jubai! Hook your nose, hey Jubai! Um, I didn't quite know what. I remember that I wanted to meet the guy next door to me in the dormitory. He was decorating his room with a SWAT stick of mobile. <laughs> I remember a brief phone call home to my parents. I can't tell you exactly uh, what the conversation was. I don't remember. I can paraphrase. I'm like, get me the fuck out of here. <laughs> Mama! Like in the movies, a spot stick. It was really quite a... The gutsiest thing I ever did there was play Shylock in The Merchant of Venice. <laughs> See, I, was, I, I became interested in the plays after a while, and I... Uh, <coughs> You know, I started to, I had to play an old man. Shylock is like, not a pussycat, but modern history has made him a very sympathetic character. He suffers because of great prejudice. And I guess Shakespeare was too hip uh, a judge and perceiver of human personality to let that moment go. I think in the fourth act, he has this wonderful speech where he talks about our Jews and Christians. Our, don't we respond to the same stimuli? If you prick us, don't we bleed? You know, that kind of thing. Fabulous. And I made myself into an old man, you know. Put on a little phony palsy shake, you know. <laughs> Get old in a hurry, you know. And I put my script exactly where I wanted the palsy shake to be as a good palsy shake. <laughs> I think I'll put another palsy shake. <laughs> Hath not a Jew hands? Hath not a Jew eyes? Hath not a Jew organs, senses, dimensions, affections, passions? Palsy shake. <laughs> Fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapons, warmed and cooled by the same winter and summer as a Christian is. And the audience went, No, you son of a bitch! Jew boy, Jew boy, Jew boy! <laughs> Get him! <laughs> Sure. <laughs> and I go, and the ethics professor, I don't know. It's quite an unusual person. My neck hurts, you know what? I just came off two trial weeks on the Evelyn Wood Speed Reading course. <laughs> Have you seen that advertised? These students are actually studying. <laughs> Two seconds. <laughs> and wasted at that. Can you really get every nuance with speed reading courses? Come on. Do you get every and and or and participle? The author may have slaved and stayed up two nights in a row. Should it be an and or an or? <laughs> and the sun's round. <coughs> or the when you're coming around that paragraph in Evelyn Wood course at 60 miles an hour, what does an and or an or mean? It becomes <laughs> They teach that in medical school, they say. University of Texas Medical School. If it's an aesthetic decision in a novel, it's a little more critical in medicine. I don't want my doctor to study with that course. The liver. <laughs> the penguin, I don't know. It looks like a cookbook at that school. <laughs> One of the finest media happenings I've ever seen in America was a, f a couple of years ago in the Thanksgiving Day football game on television, live from Detroit, Oakland to Detroit. They had sound catchers down in the field to get the authentic sounds off the field. You know, tremendous. They got a little more than they bargained for that day. You know? America's all waiting for the turkey, 40 million of them. After a tackle, they heard, I'll get you, Taylor, you cocksucker! I mean, you, 38, you know. My mother dropped the turkey. <laughs> but I submit that most Americans probably just went, no, 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 no. No, he's a nice young fellow, he will not. We hold them, see, we're so short of damn heroes that they go to the easiest one. They tap football players for corny drug commercial. Lou, I'm a tight end, I do not turn on, thank you. Ah! <laughs> I'm 
wide receiver shoes show them, and I shoot up on the field. You know. All right, I'll show you them. The point is that we're really short of heroes. And uh, let's face it, some of the sports heroes are not just that well-rounded. When I was eight years old, I lived near Yankee Stadium. I go, I love you, Mickey Mantle. I'm sorry your knees hurt. You know, I was a kid. I was so involved with every fiber in my body. When the Yankees lost the World Series to Brooklyn in 55, I was depressed for weeks. It was incredible. And my sister, older sister, was very kind, and she understood, and she said, they lost the World Series, they lost the World Series. You know. You try to kill your sister, your parents get so cranky. You know. But I'm 33 now, I have other priorities. I've seen Mickey, there's not that much happening. He is not dumb, but he's not that well-rounded that he's a hero. He's immortal. He happened to be talented. And that's it, you know. You ever see him in that brute commercial? He had three words to say. I like brute. <laughs> and I guarantee you that one word at a time. I cut Mickey great. Now, if you could give us a little more oomph on the like, that's your word for tomorrow. Come back. Willie Mays, what a great player. Willie Mays, what a gentleman, what a great... Not that much happening, I'm sorry. We like to feel good and smell good and... Uh... What laureates these athletes get. Chris Schenkel, ABC Sports, talks about Arnold Palmer, the golfer, like he was a religious figure. And what does it come from? Did he, did he found a country, fight a revolution? Did he, did he conquer a disease? No, he... Oh, what a putter, what a, what a wedge into the wind, Byron. The man is a classic. What a putter, what a wedger, what a millionaire. <laughs> what an Episcopalian, what a fine man he is. What a sock wearer, what an underwear purchaser. Anything he ever was. You know. Joe Namath, who's a pretty good athlete with a bum wheel there, you know, but the, sext, the sexist nature of his... That's the approach with Joe. He set him up as a kind of sex symbol. It's really, at this point, pretty nauseating. And uh, like the entire world, all the women are ready, you know, millions of women lined up to have intercourse with Joe. <laughs> Number 104, please. <laughs> it's uh, carried a little too far, these very, very unsubtle commercials for Noxzema. I want to see Joe Namath get cream. <laughs> Creamy cream, yeah, cream, cream. Playing the word. <laughs> Surely, cream is one of the most delicate, innocent words in the English language. In this case, the entrepreneurs hope you think it's the filthiest. <laughs> Cream, anything he sells is a sexual innuendo. You know, there's nothing I like better than hot buttered popcorn, a nice piece of ass, anytime. <laughs> and look what the example is. Look who gets the sexual success. The, 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 uh, the physical athlete, the, the, the one, you know. I think it's sad, because how about a true American hero, someone that did sacrifice? Jonas Salk, discovered a cure for polio. He probably can't even get laid. <laughs> there are not that many scientist groupies hanging around waiting for him. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Salk, my name is Myrna. Can I hold your Bunsen burners, Salk? <laughs> oh, yeah. Here's your mic. Anthropomorphism, you know, this idea of giving human traits to animals and inanimate objects. Uh, we do it all the time. We really think as if all animals were, were uh, accurately depicted in, in Disney cartoons. That we actually think that a, a fox is sneaky in a human value term, you know. He's sneaky, hey, give me that chicken pig. Hey. <laughs> you know? And a, a wolf was always vicious and predator, and we're finding out that they are quite noble by certain human standards. They care very much for their sick and wounded. Uh, a bear is always depicted as a kind of a big friendly guy in the bear. <laughs> big thick haunches on him. <laughs> With a beautiful black velvety nose that you want to go eh. Eh. Make him a kind of a reliable guy that if he was stuck in an elevator with somebody, he may as well be a bear. <laughs> he could be useful. You, Mr. Bear, can you reach up there and get the. We well, don't know, but I'll try. <laughs> Smokey the Bear has long been portrayed as a uh, 
kind of a Boy Scout with a Boy Scout hat and a chin strap. Remember, folks, very super serious. You know, only you can prevent forest fires. <laughs> and uh, I know they know that he doesn't talk and everything, but it's a kind of mentality in which 40 idiots a year visit Yellowstone Park and walk up to a bear and go, hey, yeah, Smokey, and Smokey bites his head off. <laughs> No one told him that he's supposed to be in a Boy Scout hat. Every chromosome in his big furry body is going, be a bear, be a bear, all the world. That's all he knows. I don't want to shock anyone here, but you know, according to Jane Goodall and others, there are chimpanzees in the wild, in Africa, that do not smoke cigars and wear tuxedos. <laughs> this is not generally known. They're not named Zippy and Bimbo automatically. <laughs> Seldom do they wear a little bellhops hat with a chin strap on it. <laughs> she found out in the wild they eat a lot more meat. We thought, I'd just give them a banana, he's happy. Yeah, they dig bananas. They also dig baboon babies. <laughs> and they raid them all the time. They, they, would, they are considered dangerous around human babies because they would grab them and eat them. If that sounds terribly barbaric, remember that we eat the babies of other species too when we're hungry. They don't do it out of viciousness, but I mean, I guess you never thought of a chimp that way, right? You think of him more as, look at that, he's wearing spats and a derby, looks like a person. <laughs> look at that, four hands it looks like. And spectacle, now he's sitting, oh look at that, he's reading the Wall Street Journal, he's sitting down at the table, he's eating my baby! <laughs> very anthropomorphic. I'll give you a good idea. Uh, uh, yeah, when they sell cockroach spray, they always uh, make them, they give them human personalities and an animation instead of making them impersonal vermin. You know, these little creatures are boogieing in your kitchen. This cry of sheer terror from the lookout, Jiggers rape! And in comes this fascist can. Sorry for it, you know. And they boing, and they show them dead with little graves and rest in peace. They're very sick people who make these kind of I wouldn't mind that if the product worked, but I've been dealing with cockroaches all my life in New York, and they don't give a shit about rape. They continue boogieing. They hold their nose if they have one. They go to the next apartment for four weeks. Here's a more subtle example. On the side of the can, it may say, spray underneath the sink. They like moisture. As if a cockroach can like and dislike and, and, uh, and make conscious decisions. They dislike wide open, well-lit, dry spaces. They're bored by television. They love weddings, you know. <laughs> if you spray underneath the sink, they don't go underneath the sink. They're up in the cabinet attacking the Lorna Dunes. <laughs> you can't spray the Lorna Dunes, you'll poison yourself. Kill us on direct contact, they claim. Yippee. So does your thumb for nothing. <laughs> I want you to use 50 cents worth of this poison, that kind of American habit we have of overkill, you know, and getting angry at it. <laughs> Shh. They give you a good death for the money, too, those cockroaches. <laughs> Crazy. They are 300 million years old. They'll be here a few million years after us, too. They eat the paste from wallpaper. They're not interested in your filet mignon. <laughs> not even of your filet mignon. <laughs> Here, give you an example. Cats. We have this tremendous, uh, we have this tremendous, uh, are you gonna, you're gonna come up and join me in a minute, aren't you? They have this tremendous uh, anthropomorphic fixation with cats, where, uh, you know, we go, uh, mm, we go, ooh, look at the way he walks. Look at those eyes, they know something. It's a cat, that's the way he walks. He can't walk like this. You do this to a dog, you go, come here, come here. He goes, hey, what do you got, food? What's going on here? Directed behavior. By your terms, he may be a sucker, but you know. Do this to a cat, it's like you're not doing it. Come here, and he goes, hmm. Licks his arm. 
So people put their own value system on, well, he certainly is independent, isn't he? <laughs> he's independent. I, you know, I love cats, but I mean, independent, he's independent. Sure, he's independent. He also has a brain the size of a marble. <laughs> hasn't had to hunt in centuries, been inbred for thousands of generations to live in an apartment. <laughs> I know a lady left your cat alone for a few days, she said. Oh, I'm sorry, he's gonna be bored, she said. He's gonna be bored. <laughs> bored seems such an inappropriate, you know, it's, you should have left Monopoly out for him. What am I supposed to say? He's gonna be bored. What does he do, plan his day? I think I'll go on the windowsill for a half hour. <laughs> that should carry me into noon. Uh, maybe I'll get lucky, have a cockroach on the sill. Maybe the wind will blow the Venetian blinds. Uh, chase them for a while. I do chase anything that moves. Uh, one of the disadvantages of having a brain the size of a marble, unfortunately. <laughs> We take a, uh, 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 we train a puppy, always do the same thing. The puppy shits on the piano for the 90th time. They go, oh, I'm gonna take him back, you know. Like he was an erector set or something. <laughs> what do you do? You put his nose in it, hit him on the ass, and you say, no, 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 no. Very strenuously. You figure you got a nice triple negative incentive going for you. Nose and shit, hit on the ass, and utter disapproval. No, no. No, figuring the puppy would react like you would react if someone put your nose in shit and hit you. <laughs> That sounds logical. Only one thing wrong, he's a dog. It's his business to sniff shit. not doing it on some perverse human level. That's part of his uh, system of, 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 of dominance, location. Who's here? Uh, what's going on here? What's here, the uh, collie? Uh, you know, we don't know what it is. I saw a woman in New York take her dog and the little Yorkie was being a dog. It was smelling shit. Oh, don't do that, Gwendolyn, and wipe the dog's nose off. Which is sicko to me. What is she? <laughs> If you think about it, it means that she's assuming the dog is doing it on some perverse human level. Like, I think I'll sniff shit, man. <laughs> if you try to train a dog like that, you just confuse him. Like, you know, you go, no, no, no. He goes, it's shit. It's definitely mine. What does he want? <laughs> it's in the right place under the piano. <laughs> I want to introduce you now to my piano player and friend, Phil Galston. How about a hand for Phil? <laughs> one, a two, a one, two, three, four. Yeah! Hey, Philly! something musical. What I'd like to do, um, oh, I want to show you this wonderful little thing. It's kalimba, African thumb piano. You ever see it? It's another in my educational series. Best known for its use in this country by department stores. <laughs> Thank you. 
come to Jamaica. <laughs> you feel like a child again there. And Jamaica has mountains, waterfalls, poverty. <laughs> come see the aftermath of colonialism at its very best. In Jamaica, where the police have complete search and seizure power. <laughs> Jamaica. We'd like to rip you off for a change. Jamaican Tourist Bureau, 30 in a room, no FN not included, no, April 1st, Battle Creek, Michigan. <laughs> this is my mouth harp. I'm putting some water in my mouth harp. Make it play, but we like to do a song improv. We do it all the time and we enjoy it. And we take a chance, sort of, we don't do it every time, but we don't have a set song that we spring on you. I promise you that. We try to do it from scratch. And uh, if it works, it's great. You know, audiences love spontaneity, we do. Everybody roots for us. And uh, there's a few freaks that kind of like to see the girl drop the baton in the parade. <laughs> she did it again! <laughs> well, everybody has their own thrill. Does anyone have an obscure title? If it works, it looks great. You know, if it doesn't work, you got a couple of assholes standing up here <laughs> trying to look good, blaming each other. A louder Phil, a softer, uh, he's new. His cousin died. I'll make any of <laughs> Anyone have an obscure title? Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. <laughs> Suddenly I realized the world was turning around me. Sorry, I didn't get anything but Zen. We have to be a little more orderly. Raise your hand and let me, let me like the press conference, yes. Dear Abby, oh, dear Abby, okay. <laughs> That's a good provocative time. I was on television her with, with her recently, and she was tickling my neck. It was really turned me on. She's 68. <laughs> yes. Cows are dumb. Cows are dumb, dear Abby. Okay. I think I have enough. I know I've definitely had enough. Okay, let's do a little tune for you now. Can we have some mood lighting, please? Thank you. It's perfect. I think it's Cows Are Dumb and Dear Abby. <laughs> Phil and I'd like to do a little tune for you now. It's been so good to us on the tour. <laughs> a tune that uh, was written in Memphis a few years ago by some friends of mine.
Then call the county hospital. I feel I may do myself in. I've had enough, and now I'm right near you. What lower posture can a human form take but to have my last friend be you? <laughs> Distant pen pal, sort of impersonal type who reads a million letters, at least your assistants do. <laughs> Baby, will you answer me, please? Who will you answer me, please? Everybody! so much for the false ending of the show. <laughs> no, what do you think, I'm a maniac? I'm gonna run back and forth for 20 encores? I name my name. <laughs> well, you never know, you know. You come out and uh, you got five encores. Oh, they're still clapping, should I come out? You come out for the six and they stop. <laughs> I left my hanky. <laughs> well, I put myself on the line. I named my new album New Teeth because I had a terrible, terrible year, dentally, you know. And uh, I was chewing bazooka bubblegum recently, a nice double wad. And when that sugar explodes in your mouth in the first two minutes, you know, gives you everything it has and more. <laughs> and it comes out, you know, and explodes. And five minutes later, you know you, you have some. Five minutes, it becomes pink rubber, right? <laughs> But now it's exploding, and it went into a leaky filling, and, forget. and uh, to me, dental pain is the worst of all time. It is. Uh, you know how people compare pain? Have you ever heard those conversations? Well, there's nothing like childbirth. It's the worst. Oh yeah, you ever get kicked in the balls? Oh yeah. <laughs> You're all wrong. Kidney stones, you know. The, the rabies needles in the stomach, you know. Everybody has their own. To me, dental. And uh, the dentist's office is such a drag. It smells some cloves. Everything is teeth. The lamp is a giant molar. Cute one, teeth. Before and after shots of disease gums on the wall. After six months of treatment. <laughs> after 22, uh, you know. Sit down in his chair. He's got this spittoon that's always going around there. An ecological nightmare. 15,000 gallons of water a day go down the sewer for 10 spits. <laughs> Bad Muzak in the office. He puts a paper bib on you and first he froves, you know. He takes that frove and he gets into the decay area and kind of tests it and sends you agony. <laughs> For this you pay him to $10 or something. Then he warms up his weapon. You know that drill that he controls from the floor there? Woo! <laughs> He's never satisfied with the point. I don't believe that'll hurt enough. Yeah, that'll send him through the ceiling. Okay, open the hangar, let the airplane in. What are you gonna do now, Doc? Well, I'm gonna take a steel bird drill, Mr. Klein. Very slow speed, four revolutions per minute. We're gonna see smoke on this job. I'm gonna drill through the hard enamel of the tooth into the soft inner pulp, causing you incredible pain. That'll be $25. Open the hangar, let the air frame. I'm 33. Open the hangar, let the air. Forget how old you are. A B-29? <laughs> and the water. <sighs> <laughs> 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 
get mesmerized by the drain. <laughs> well, I think psychologically, I'd rather be in the sewer than this. Alice in Wonderland followed her down. Then my favorite part comes now, the good old air. <laughs> what do you want to know? Most dentists are good at lying about how much there is to go. But, uh, they're always almost through, even if they just start. Almost through. <laughs> almost done now. <laughs> almost through. <laughs> One o'clock, two o'clock, three, four. <laughs> Wednesday, Thursday. <laughs> Winter, spring. <laughs> I had one dentist that if it hurt you, tap me hard on the back. Tap me on the back. I almost broke three of his ribs. <laughs> It's a slightly counterproductive maneuver to hit someone hard on the back who has a live drill in your mouth. Unless you're in the market for a third nostril. <laughs> then he starts loading my mouth with all kinds of passion. You know. I can't talk now. Huh? Those clamps that eat into your gum, cotton wads, and then the ultimate humiliation, the sucking question mark. <laughs> can take your tongue with it. It's supposed to keep you from asphyxiating, you know, like an oral hoover, four horsepower. Now my mouth is completely full. I cannot talk. Now he starts conversations with me that I can't finish. He never chooses subjects like the weather that I can answer with a grunt. He always chooses things I feel compelled to answer. I understand your mother's been having an affair with the superintendent. Ooh, ooh. And President Nixon sure got a rough deal. Why don't they get off his back? <laughs> now, I, I, I'm in tremendous pain. I get a few needles, but the discomfort and pain are always over there. I found nitrous oxide or laughing gas. <laughs> different concept in dentistry, mind you. With nitrous oxide, you feel the pain, but you don't give a shit. It's kind of leaving your mouth off for an hour while you come back for it later. <coughs> the body metabolizes it easily. Two blows of oxygen, you're really where you started. You go home. You don't have to recuperate in a room or anything. But uh, it's quite a smashing high, and of course they try to uh, prepare you for it with this jargon they learned in gas school, you know. <laughs> Robert, very calmly, you will feel like you've had several martinis, you know. I'm in total pain, right? The guy's going through the spiel. And, uh, breathe slowly and evenly through this mass. Now, I'll be giving you a mixture of nitrogen and... I said, give me that! <laughs> well, I think you've had enough, Mr. Clay. I said, give me that! I tell you, I've had enough. It's my pain. <laughs> How can you know when I've had enough? You can't feel my pain. What are we, the Corsican brothers? <laughs> feel, uh, I don't know. Feel good, I, I, uh, um, I know where I am and I, I feel like I'm gonna vulnerable, like I'm gonna say something stupid, you know? I don't know you that well, but I feel like I could say, tutu, boo 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 <laughs> that awful music you you had before Uh, 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 uh.
thank you, Lord, for stopping my head. <laughs> oh, it feels so good. Just sitting down there with foot on the ground like a leg on the beach. Whoa, 